Greetings, metalheads and maiden maniacs. How are we? Welcome to episode 24 of Maiden Cast. And this week we are doing. Oh, fucking hell, son. Oh, well, I don't know what to do now. That's completely thrown me off. I've got to go. You've got to go and hunt for it. It's all right. Look, we're doing. Professional. Yes. Oh, God. What a mess. Anyway, so what we're doing is the Chemical Wedding by Bruce Dickinson. I've got to show it off, haven't I? Because the artwork's awesome. I'm just wondering where it is. Well, surely it'd be in alphabetical order, wouldn't it? It'll be on the thumbnail anyway, so you all know what it looks like. But, uh... but in case you didn't know, in case you didn't know what it was called, apparently it's from. Uh... A William Blake painting called The Ghost of the Flea. Right. Yeah, it's from a William Blake painting. And we are doing The Chemical Wedding by Bruce yeah. Dickinson. And uh, and you've got to show this artwork off because this artwork is absolutely superb. It is, we've got, um, I've got the special edition as well. Uh, are we doing bonus tracks this week? Yeah, I gave them a listen, so... Um... Well, to be honest with you, if you are again, if you are new to all this and you're looking to pick stuff up, I would uh, you'd be. It's probably harder to get an edition that hasn't got the bonus tracks. Yeah, yeah. In all really fairness, should, especially if you're uh, if you're going on Amazon or going to HMV, if HMV ever opens again, um, yeah, the special edition will be the one that you'll get. You yeah, unless you're in a second hand. Yeah, second-hand uh, record shop might have it, but yeah, it's easier to get hold of the expanded edition. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So. Unless you, uh, unless you have the luck that I had. Oh yes, yeah. go on, tell us, yeah. tell us the story. Yep. Random, random visit to Camden as I used to do when I was uh, back at college. You know, oh, I can't be asked to go to college. Um, fuck it, let's go to Camden for the day. And um, there was a, as Joe was saying, there, there was a second-hand record shop there and like rarities and all that. And um, I was just flicking through as you do. Got it, got it, got it, got it, need, need, sort of thing. And then, um, lo and behold, I think it was three months before the album came out, was a copy of The Chemical Wedding. How the fuck did that and end And it up? was literally just a CD case. The back of it was blank. There was no insert. All there was was an insert of the, of the artwork in the front, just on a blank bit of paper. There's no booklet, just that. Mm. And the CD, promo copy, in there, and I think it was fucking six ninety nine. It was all the Christmases you could ever want come at once. And I grabbed it. I fucking grabbed it like I stole it. I got out of this quickly. It was like in case, it, in case someone caught me with it and that was illegal or whatever. And I fucking trained straight home. See ya. And, um, Either that or it was, um, oh shit, we didn't mean to sell that. that was, <laughs> yeah, so it's like, get out of there. Someone's got, someone's, who's got a mate that works in Metal Hammer works in that shop and he put it on the table. <laughs> You know. And then he's going to get a co on his coffee break and put on a... Did you... <laughs> I would... I'll put it out to for sale. Did yeah. you not... No! Oh, yeah, sorry. So, <laughs> no track list, no fuck all. It was, uh, it was just literally the printed CD and the fucking artwork on a plane, just one sheet. So, yeah, I was out of there quick. Yeah, I, I couldn't even listen... I couldn't even listen to it on the way home because I had a Discman. I had a mini disc player at the time. I didn't have my CD Discman. So I had to just look at it on the train home. <laughs> oh mate, it was quality. I'd um, I'd like I'd laugh if like for about three months you read like some death metal album or like something. <laughs> yeah, just random shit. Like, oh, Bruce is taking a turn for the worse on this one. <laughs> yeah, get it. It's <laughs> something else. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, promos. I mean, that must have been a really good thing. I mean, obviously, I do the. You know, I, I write for magazines and a couple of different websites, and uh, what I get now is a download. I, get, I just get a link. Yeah, and I download it, and yeah, there's a little press release, but that must have been really good when you get those little. I'm trying to think if I've got any nearby. Sometimes when you pick up albums on Discogs and things, it's cheaper just to get a promo copy. Yeah. Um, and you normally get it in a little cardboard. Yeah, sleeve, little card or, sleeve in it. Yeah. Or sometimes it's a you know, you get a little fold out bit of paper with a press release on it and things yeah. like that. There are. Uh, they're pretty cool to get. I mean, some people go a bit over the top and spend loads of money on them, and it's like, no, that's not that's not the point. It's, no, that's it. It's, yeah, pick them up cheap as a little. Oh, look, I've got that as well. Yeah, you know, 
don't um, get carried away with it. But yeah, the um, off. Are we going to do story time this week? There's quite a bit of a lengthy explanation here from Bruce. As well. Um, I suppose you could say this is much more uh, contemporary album in terms of the way it sounds. I think what we've done on this album is extended and expanded upon the repertoire of Accident of Birth. Accident of Birth, I mean, what a great album, but it was almost a summation of everything I've done up until now. This album goes beyond that. I've actually stepped into new territory, and this is kind of virgin turf for me. The closing song to the last album is probably something like Jerusalem, and the closest thing you'll ever get to a sort of progressive epic metal type thing. And maybe the Book of Fell is a uh, feel, feel. I said the Book of Fell. T H E L. Book of Fell, wasn't it? Oh, is that? Fell. There you go. Yeah. That's what I think, yeah. I said the book of Phil. Well, Who's Phil? That's how it came out, because of my... Because uh, <laughs> of my f- fucking... Essex. You know, yeah. And uh, Although a lot of people say Cockney. And I said, you'd say oh. to a Cockney that I've yeah. got a Cockney accent. They'd tell you to fuck off. It's yeah. estuary is the yeah. correct term. Yeah, they'll, um, they'll soon tell you the difference. Um, anyway, carrying on. Uh, it's close to something like Aquarius, because of its structure, maybe. But we're really moving into the area now of taking just the sound, the raw sound of things, to new extremes. The lyrics are kind of trippy, and it's basically a concept album about alchemy. But alchemy, as I was researching it, rapidly starts to feel a bit flat. After doing a couple of songs about alchemy, it's like, OK, so, duh, it's a bunch of chemists trying to recreate the divine through chemistry. So once you've got that out of the way, what else is there? But what came cropping up in all these alchemy books I was reading was William Blake, who was a mystical English poet from the last century, lived 1770-ish to sort of 1830. He was an artist and a poet, and also in many ways he was sort of related to the alchemists. He was used, and he used a lot of their imagery. One of his big heroes, he wrote one of his big epic poems called Newton, which was dedicated to Isaac Newton, who was an alchemist, which is something that can be covered up successfully by historians and scientists, because it's not coal. For the inventor of rationalist science to be into the occult, I I kind of misread that, because it's not coal for the inventor of rationalist science to be in the occult. This was the main reason for being his main reason for being into science because he was interested in mysticism. Mysticism, ladies and gentlemen, that's a funny little rabbit hole to go down. Look into it. And um, yeah, I'll leave that little tidbit with you lot. (laughs) Um, So William Blake is someone I've been aware of since I was a little kid. And ever since one of his paintings was used for Atomic Rooster. Do you remember them? Not Atomic Kitten, Atomic Rooster. No, I don't. Um, Necro, no, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Um, how the fuck did you know that? Because I can only assume that's what it is. Right. Um, it's the same, yeah, there's a William Blake on that album cover. Um, so one day I just decided to make this album three-dimensional. I gave it a soul, a presence, and a lot of things that Blake was writing about. His imagery, his language, really struck a chord with me personally. I felt it was almost a uh, kindred spirit. Not like I was anything near as talented as him, but still I thought, wow, I understand this man and where he's coming from and what he feels and how he sees things. And I thought, well, what a wonderful muse to have for an album. So what's the album starting being about? So what's the album started being about? It was an album about alchemy inspired by the artwork and poetry of William Blake. And I thought, that's what I'm writing. Wow, that's base. That this is really worth writing about. This is really worth doing. Everything just dropped into place from then, and I really enjoyed it. Even though it was kind of nerve wracking, I didn't have a whole lot of time. We had two months to write the album. Two months they wrote this album in, crazy, um, and two weeks to rehearse it, and six weeks to record it, and two weeks to mix it. Now, Axel Rose, when you spent twelve years 
on the fucking Chinese democracy, which isn't as bad an album as people make out, by the way. But well, it weren't worth spending 10 years on. Makes you wonder what Tall could have got done in that time. Tall, another prime example, yeah. Just, just right. Never, never let perfection be the enemy of done. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, um, so that's Bruce and then Roy Z. This is nice and quick. So I'm also Roy Z. Well, who's Ed? Roy's. Who's? Roy's. Oh. Is Ed? Right. That's the one, yeah. Um, accident was basically a statement that... Right. Accident was basically a statement that he was back. And I didn't, and I'm glad Bruce didn't, make another one of those. Because I think he would have pissed a lot of people off. I think Bruce is artistically as pleased as he's ever been with Chemical Wedding. I think it really translated well what he felt. To me... I think technically accident sounds really good. And there's some songs out there that I just flip out every time I hear them. But Chemical has a more cohes- is a more cohesive package. It was put together it was put together better and more thought out and the sound was had more depth to it. More dimension. All right. Well, it definitely had more depth to it considering they put bass guitars on the bass strings on the fucking guitar. Yeah, where was that? Of, uh, just to make it so monstrously heavy. If you do get this uh, expanded edition as well, you do get a pretty good write up as well. And um, I'm not going to. I can't remember. I think that is true, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I've come from multiple sources, so I think it is legit. Because definitely the guitars definitely sound different. I'm just skimming through it now. I'm just seeing if there's anything about it, but I don't think there is. No, um, this just says it keeps the thing. Pursuing the heaviest sounds possible, Roy and Adrian had even re-threaded their axes with bass strings to achieve the thunderous bottom end. There you go. Yes, yeah, so you're right. That is legit. And, um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, it sounds fucking it sounds ridiculous. So God knows what tuning they're in. But, um, and just to that big um, long explanation of what the album's about there's a quote in this who cares what the songs are about as long as it rocks like a bastard okay cheers Bruce <laughs> let's come on that a minute ago. the last five minutes yeah. obsolete yeah. <laughs> but it does rock like a bastard this is Bruce's solo masterpiece and I can say out the gate that this is one of my favourite metal albums Bog Stop um, not in my top five, maybe definitely in the top ten, I reckon. Fucking hell. I mean, it's, it's everything he's been building the walls, isn't it? You know, all the all the itch scratching he did on Balls to Picasso and Skunk Works and that, and getting together with Adrian again on um, Accent of Birth. But this is sort of like the... And I think with Accent of Birth, he made the album he kind of should have made with Balls of P- to Balls Picasso. Picasso but yeah, but they got... got they kind of had an the back- studio, didn't they? Yeah, and he had like a session that he abandoned and started again, yeah. and it was a bit of a hodgepodge. And yeah, I mean, I, th- I can't see it happening now, but maybe, you know, I know the uh, whole re recording an album is controversial to a lot of people. I don't know why. I don't know what why people get so pissed off about it, but um, I don't see what's wrong with revisiting a work. I mean, it's a companion piece, isn't it? I mean, look at Bonded yeah, by so- Blood. When they re recorded that, it sounded a fucking thousand times better. Right, I know people that kill you for that statement. <laughs> uh, I know. But I'm not one of them. I, I, I saw... Production uh, values have moved on. We're doing a bit of digression, yeah. but yes, we do, but... I don't see what a band's just revisiting their first album. It shows you how far they've come. If the albums, It shows that the album stood the test of time, because exactly. it still sounds great. It. Modern production, 20 years' experience on top of them originally playing exactly. it. Exactly, yes. And... Um, the Bonded by Blood one, um, by Exodus in question, um, that was originally they were going to do it as a live album. Yeah, they did. And well, it, they did. Um, they did a live I, album for Century Media, where they uh, with the current because they they tuned down a lot by then, didn't they? Because they yeah. they'd taken the nineties on board and tuned down and all that sort of shit. And the song sounded just like Testament did when they did First Strike, yeah, Still Deadly, um, monstrously heavy, and it just yeah. gave the songs a fucking new lease of life. And. Uh, Anthrax did it. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the album. The two evils. I think uh, Annihilator pretty much found a balance because they did a CD 
of the hits re-recorded, and that was a bonus on the right, special yeah. edition of the new album. So that was, but um, yeah, I just it's a companion piece. It's not as if Bonded by Blood was just erased, and you've got no, that. Still, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, I and basically it's a stopgap release. Now there's a couple of different types of stopgap releases. There's a live album, yeah, re-recording of an old, uh, you know, revisiting an old album. B sides and odds and sods. Yeah, I know you get the odd gem, but let's face it, how often or a best of compilation with like two yes. new songs on it. So, yeah, well, out of all them, now live albums are cold, but let's face it, they a lot of them uh, made and are probably one of the worst for it. But you yeah. get like one with every tour, like yeah, shit, yeah, um, yeah, something a bit different, and yeah, why are people. That one in particular though, was really. I remember um, Gary Holt having to like do an interview with a with a band. I think it was they were called Bonded by Blood as well, and it was like the whole interview was him justifying doing it. And I don't know why he fucking even did the interview. It's like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm Gary yeah. fucking Holt, mate. Your That's band's it, yeah, named after my album. Yeah, fuck yourself. I don't answer yeah. you. But, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, fucking weird. No, nah, same same with film remakes, isn't it? It's you know, no one's saying that they're going to erase the first one. And oh, and that's the one. That was my thing as well. It's like I bet half these people that bitch about the people bands re-recording old songs are the first in line when you have some shitty horror reboot and remake. Yeah. And uh, yeah, anyway, rant over. Back to the. Yes, get, back we get on to that anyway. Uh, so. We basically pick up where we left off after Accident of Birth. Um, yeah, it's still... We said about re-recording Bulls to Picasso, didn't yeah. we? Um, so, yeah, but Bruce finds his feet, finally. He, um, I think he realises he... Well, no he matter... Not so much finds his feet. I think he, he found his feet previously, but he's managed to stay on the level ground, hasn't he? He hasn't, he hasn't slipped off or let creative fucking... Oh, what if we did this, you know? Yeah, but so I think like, he finally went, look, I'm a metal singer. People yeah, want a it. metal album out yeah. of me. How about all this good stuff that's going on now? Yeah. Let's get in, you know, be it new metal here or death metal there or, you know, the sounds are changing. How about yeah. I get that and interject it with this? And, and again, and work, working with Roy and the Tribe of Gypsies, they're obviously where they're from, you know, South LA, they've got all these different cultural melting pots there. All the hardcore scene, the fucking thrash scene, yeah. all this fucking stuff. It's all all coming together in a melting pot, isn't it? Yeah. And then um and that and that final cherry on the cake was uh, getting Adrian. Getting, yeah, exactly, yeah. So he's got a great formula, he's got a great team. Don't break what don't fix what isn't broken. That's it. And um yeah, and it basically to me, this is Terminator One and Terminator Two. It's just expanded upon, built upon, improved upon. And yeah, and then we've got a masterpiece, really. Review over. Done. <laughs> See you all next week. <laughs> I've really, you know, when you have one of those painful ones where you're just repeating yourself, going, yeah, it's yeah. a pretty good song. I mean, no, oh, yeah. ancient place. It's kind of like that, but the opposite. I'm just like, yeah, it's awesome. Next. Yeah. So, <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm a lot more not critical is the wrong word, but I'm looking at this with different light, listening to it in sequence of the albums and all the rest of it, because I haven't listened to this album properly for a long time. I've got mm. two or three favourites that I always revisit, but listening to the album as a whole, I haven't done that for many years, and it's, um, I think we're going to have a not a disagreement, but I won't be as straight down the line with it as you are. Well then, yeah. shall we begin? Yeah. Well, yeah, King and Crimson. King and Crimson, the um, everyone's well, favourite prog rock band. Yeah. Uh, For me, um, not not the best way to start the album. I always skipped it. Aside from you know when it kicks in, it's like how fucking heavy is this? You get the drums kicking in, it kicks in with he's such... It's like someone has unleashed the Balrog from fucking Fellowship of the Ring. It's like, <clears throat> it's like so fucking heavy. It's unreal. Yeah. But aside from that initial grab-me-by-the-balls moment, 
I don't think the song speaks to me very much. I think it's, it's quite plodding, actually, and it's over long as well. And it's very much an album that, for me, gets gets better. But I think I'm going to get through it. But I think it's very much weighted to the centre of the album. Things get better, then they slack off as we go from top to bottom. Oh, you yeah. Know, I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with a song. I just think it's... I think it was, I'll agree with you. In um, if I was if I was, if we was putting together a band now and we was going to do a Bruce Dickinson set, like just from the solo albums, yeah, King and Crimson wouldn't be on the top of songs to play. From I'd probably go with the Tower or yeah. You know. I mean, to to be going back to that, talking about sets. I mean, I actually I actually saw him on this tour at the LA two. And he opened. And it he didn't his, open with no. And it was his, actually it was his last ever live show that he did. Yeah. This was the last one he did. To, obviously, when he rejoined Maiden, and they opened the set list with Trumpets of Jericho. Yes, and that's the same thing that they um, they opened with the live album that was off the back of this. Uh, yeah. Scream for me, Brazil. Which yeah. tells you they sort of looking at the track list and afterwards going, you know what? It's not quite. Thing about they go into King and Crimson as a second track. And I might feel a bit differently about it if it's mm. track number two. But yeah. that's to me, it doesn't really speak. It's it's like, oh shit, really? Got this got this great album that I remember, but it's like, oh fuck, this song's quite plodding and just you know, nothing wrong with it, but it's um where's the skip button? Uh, it, it does remind me a lot of uh, Black Sabbath actually, this song. Um Dio era. All right. Uh well, that Tony Iomi's riffs are you know, Tony Iommi, he's just as distinctive a guitar player. Yeah. And a stylist as um as a as a singer, really. I mean I can I, I yeah, all the way through a lot of people say that like, how different the catalogue is. It's like, yeah, but that running thread is Tony Iommi. And um yeah, just that dun, 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 bum, bum. Yeah, I see that, yeah, big time. Yeah, and then and again, especially on the um, accent of birth, it's like I can really hear Dio on this and um, the influence Dio had on Bruce, which is something Bruce has never denied. Yeah, I mean, uh, who's going to deny it? You know what I mean? He's one of yeah, the fucking and, greatest and vocalists ever. Like the, and a, uh, me comparing it to Dio is, a, it, I mean, complimentary as well. Yeah. And yeah, this just reminds me of something that would come on um, one of the later Sabbath albums when... Um, you know, again, Tony really kind of accepted what he was known for and just ran ran with it all the more. I mean, yeah, if if, if it's big heavy riffs that you want off me, that's what I'll just give you then because he yeah, went a bit but, experimental towards yeah. the end of the seventies. But um, and yeah, just so that nice thick riff just setting it, it just sets the tone nicely. It's always nice hearing Bruce sing over heavier stuff as well. And yeah, yeah and never, with he never that, gets to do it with Maiden, does he? Because it's not obviously not Maiden's bag, is it? You know, it's no. a no, it's, it's and arguably just, they take I know it's going to come a bit later, but when Tyranny of Souls carries on the heaviness, doesn't it, with Roy Z? Yeah, you know, that yeah. Thing, like, it might even go further because it's been a while since I've listened to it, but I've got vast memories of certain certain bits being like, fucking hell, what, this is ridiculous, yeah. Yeah, so that's a well. I say it's an overlooked album, but it was an overlooked album. Yeah, it just it just was thrown no, out there, wasn't it? <laughs> it was just thrown out. No gigs, no no not much press. No. And um, I remember an interview with Bruce Dickinson was literally just attached to the review, and it was like a little <laughs> five question thing. And um, he just said, "There's no one that just listens to my solo albums and doesn't listen to Maiden, so of course it's going to be compared to it." But yeah. um, well, get, yeah, he. Basically, he just said this album was done purely because I wanted to. There was no label, no one chasing it. It's not as if I'm going to be able to do anything to promote it. No, so it. I literally okay. did this for a laugh. So take or leave it, sort of thing. Fair enough. Although it does kind of carry on, like artwork-wise. I know it's not William Blake artwork, but it's, it's sort of in the same theme, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to revisiting that. I won't learn in a while myself. Um, but yeah. And again, great soaring chorus. All right. Yes, so yes. Yeah, that is one. King, and, and, and the way he just sort of says, because that the king in crimson comes, it, he never quite fully sings it as no. it, he just sort of does it that theatrical. 
the king in crimson. Oh yeah, yeah. he's at the height of he's in his element and he's singing yeah. all this sort of shit. But yeah. no, that's it's probably the best bit of the song is of course because like I say, it's a bit it, it does soar. Um, is the song a little over long? Yeah, that is probably the only. Yeah, some of the songs do do. Um, do it's go a on common a bit. complaint through the album, I think. Is but fucking hell, what yeah. comes later with um, yeah. Yeah. with uh, Maiden? It's, it's <laughs> a Sex Pistols yeah. album. That's so. It, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. and none of it really goes too indulging. I think a lot of it no, just no, kind of yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, a bit of atmosphere building at the beginning, or a little bit of, but yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a great little opener. Yeah, it's we're far from the best, but like I say, this is a good scene setter and a good icebreaker. So, yeah. Right. Anything else? No, I mean, like I say, I you know I I do skip it, it's because it just doesn't speak to me as an album opener should. You know, it's not not like Freak, or um, you know what I mean? It's not. Doesn't grab you. Yeah. So, um, I think as well, the, um, what did I say? I don't think, I think this is, I was said about this with uh, the Sabbath show I did with uh, Chris Jennings from uh, worshipmetal.com. Um, I had a really good laugh with Chris. I'm going to get him back on um, at some point and we're going to do something else. Um, we looked at the first two Sabbath albums and I said, it's funny, I mean, because the second album is the all rounds better album. But my favourite songs are on the first. That meant, I, and I do yeah. think some the only thing missing from this is some of the songs from Maximum Birth. I'd yeah. like to Yeah, it makes you wonder on. if they'd have done a, if he'd have waited a year mm. and they put the best of them together. You know, it's it's like where where I've referred to it before with Peace of Mind and Power Slave. If they'd waited just a little bit longer, yeah, yeah. And pulled all their resources, you you're you're talking about an album that would be like just on the top of the fucking pile forever. Yeah, I don't know. Did I t- say this? Did I tell you about Monstrosity? No. Yeah, uh, the um, their last album. Uh, their last album, I put up there with Symbolic. Fucking hell. Yeah, and um, he said the uh, it's twelve songs, and um, they had to reduce it to ten so it fitted on the LP, which you can't pick. <laughs> like, yeah, and. Oh, um, so he said the seed he went there to change the order of the songs as well to fit it on the album. Oh shit, yeah, I do remember yeah. you saying this, yeah. And so he said if you get the C D, that's actually how it's meant to be in order with the two extra songs. They're not bonus songs. Yeah. They were meant to be. Yeah. But he said they didn't do an album for eleven years. He went, it was never meant to be a break. The brand never broke up. He went, there was just always something that came up and yeah. Yeah, it just got pushed back and pushed back. He went, but it was a bit of a it was it, it was really good. He went because the ten songs that we had for the album, so we would have done like this might have been, we might have done another album in those living years, another two albums. So those ten songs for the new album were sitting there, and in that time another one came in. I went, oh well, that one can go, and then that, and then another two songs came in. Oh well, put them on. Oh, yeah, that one can go, and it, it it just condensed and just crushed everything into this diamond. He went. So what you've got is two three albums worth but it's the 12 songs yeah it's the it's the four songs off of three albums all crushed into yeah. one and uh i mean so it's a blessing in disguise in a way he went but yeah i'm certainly not planning on waiting another living years I mean, yeah. it, was, it wasn't by design but uh yeah so i see what you mean with that but i don't know i think this album sounds well on its own but yeah there's there's certain songs on Accent of Birth that I think would fit on this quite nicely. Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, you can tell it's the start of a process. Mm. Um, yeah, so Chemical Wedding. Well, yeah, title track, and um, this is where the shit kicks in, mate. This is yeah. a fucking. This is a great song. It's um, I love the drums in it. Oh, um, Dave Ingram, the or is it Eddie Casillas? I can't fucking remember. Um, no, Dave, it's Ingram. Dave, Dave Ingram on drums. Yeah. <laughs> He plays a plays a quite you know a wicked drum beat under this, mm. you know, you know, really keeps it going and all that, and it's a good riff as well. But then it sort of takes the level right down. We get the old nice mellow choruses. Yeah, and soars back up for the kind of, kind of dark and gothic sounding as well. I oh, it's big time. Yes, yeah. I can you know, see. 
I think this is one of the best songs he's ever recorded. I think as well with William Blake and Alistair Crowley and... Yeah, because this was the fucking um, title track of the film, wasn't it? I kind of get that Victorian image in, in my head as well. Like an old Victorian house of, you know, yeah. someone doing some experiment. <laughs> some yeah, Jekyll no, and Hyde yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. And... Uh, that's quite a good line as well. Trying, trying to find the divine through chemistry, trying yeah. to create. Which what is what they, you know, if you believe all the stories and that from that time, it's, it's what they were doing, wasn't it? You know, I was always trying to do push the fucking push the limits, all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's an interesting time. I mean, I've I've um, had a look into William Blake uh, whilst listening to this. I'm, uh, I've seen a couple of things I quite like the look of. There's some nice books with a collection of his poems and yeah. paintings as well and there's actually a um a copy of the divine comedy i've got the divine comedy down there actually um yeah because it was written, it written when it it was written as he wrote a thing about milton didn't he no yeah the, the, there's an edition of the um divine comedy with paintings made by william blake yeah going through it all and um that's a real fucking epic piece of uh, writing. It's, it's quite hard to get around because it's a bit like reading the Bible. It's all in yeah, and yeah. these shall say to thee da 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 da, da. and you, you have to kind of, a bit like reading Shakespeare, you have to kind of yeah. tune yourself in. Yeah. But once you get used to it, it makes sense but you got to get your head around it a bit. But Dante, with the Divine Comedy, basically invented romance. Like love how we see love today which we think is just a given. No one wrote like that until, and it was all because he loved a woman that he never approached. And him going into hell and finding heaven through it was basically what he was willing to go through for her. Oh, right. okay. And that is how we see love today is, was from that book. It's fucking mental when you <laughs> look into the history of certain things. Yeah. And um, yeah, so this divine comedy, um, I think they're always talking about making a film of it where they go for the hell because he's going through hell and then there's the nine circles of hell. Yeah. Different levels of it and that, that gets referenced in, you know, fucking Pirates of the Caribbean now. Yeah. Um, you know, the deepest circle is for traitors and yeah, that's, yeah. all the rest of it. Then he goes through, then there's the second part where he goes through um, purgatory and then, yeah, that's when he gets to heaven because yeah, comedy really- as well. Well, you get seven deadly sins from, isn't it? Well, it's the um, divine comedy, but comedy, the word comedy actually means tragedy. Yeah. Which I didn't know either. It's, um, but yeah, this divine, com- with the William Blake paintings, I thought, oh, wow, right, that's a cool thing to get. So I had my eye on that. But yeah, I, I'm really intrigued now. I want to dive a bit deeper. I, well, I think, you know, that was, it was so sort of prevalent around that time because that was around about the time when you, the first time really you could experiment with stuff like that without fear of being called a heretic by the church and being burned at the fucking stake because that's when the religion's influence had started to wane a bit yeah so it's everyone a, was like, that's a bit right, of a rocky thing as well because let's like fucking the, go we can do it you know some of the most beautiful um chapels that are up today but um notre dame was built during the dark ages so i don't quite get how that was it was this whole thing that we were all living in fields like in that Monty Python sketch you know it was like no people were looking into things at that time so yeah, yeah it's case of if it wasn't done with the under the fucking guidance or with the permission of the church you're going to get a drill you know an old drilled in your head yeah you know yeah. And that's what I say we'd be colonizing space if it weren't for that time because it cost us fucking several hundred years of advancement yeah because we're really colonizing it now no, that's what I'm saying, but you would have been you're 200, <laughs> you're three, two, three hundred years behind where you should be because of that period of time when the church was like, right, that's all that matters. If it's in the book, it's good. If it ain't in the book, you know, you can do one. And so that's why I think now this was an, like around this time of William Blake, it was an explosion of fucking all this sort of experimentation yeah. and all this sort of stuff because yeah. you didn't have to live in fear of it anymore. Yeah. Or the church won't be happy. Who fucking cares? Yeah. You know, so that's probably why there's so many different things around this period of time. I, I, I'm just saying, yeah, we're not exactly colonising space right now because no. of uh, what's going on culturally at the moment. Yeah. 
when um you know people are worried about you know their pronouns rather than <laughs> learning yeah th th i'm wondering how many people are graduating with science degrees right now and uh you know how many people are actually applying for these jobs where they look into these things rather than you know but anyway on we go uh yeah chemical wedding uh, there's always uh, we focus a lot on album openers but i always think like the uh second yeah it tells you where you track. are doesn't it because yeah, you've had, uh, you've had the a statement good. it's where do we go for me it's really thing, sets the tone it's got a great um it's just just a brilliant atmosphere on this song and yeah. yeah and when it opens as well when i talk about soaring choruses this just opens oh, up it does, doesn't it? yeah big time yeah he, uh, the guitars aren't really doing much they're just sort of back holding uh bruce's yeah. vocals it's just a up. nice little nice little foundation yeah. for bruce to do his thing isn't it it's um and yeah and what a fantastic solo as well the yeah. um is it a, what I worry about is what, not worry about it. That's a bit. I always have a bit of a thing when the back, when a guitarist takes over and just leads the song with a melody. Now that -na 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 -na, you know the little bit I'm talking about. Yeah. Now if this was played on a piano, that'd just be part of the song. But so it's a guitar solo. But yeah. always a guitar solo like just when the guitarist just goes off on one. And goes, -na 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 -na. Yeah, but still, it's still, a, it's still a, yeah, it's sort of half and half, isn't it? I know what you're saying. But it's definitely a, a it's more like a lead section than a solo. Yeah. It would be the right. I always, I always. Yeah. Yeah. What point is this like? Because when um, Kirk Hammett say on Unforgiven, yeah. da, 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 like that's a solo. That's a solo. Yeah. In but, fact, uh, I found, I'm glad you brought that up because that is the solo as far as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't. Oh, is it my? I know a couple of my favourites. I mean, I, 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 my favourites is Master of Puppets, um, Death, uh, Second Face. Is it Second Face? No, that's not right, is it? It's on fucking human. It's Second Face. Sure it is. Yeah, anyway, stuff like that is some of my thing. But yeah, that is a good one. But, um, I don't really, it's not a debate I'm willing to have to date. <laughs> no, it's, it. it's just, yeah. Uh, but now I think the bit in this it is, I suppose it is a solo, but it's just not a, it's not a fucking balls to the wall, Dave Murray fret blazer, is it? It's no, but it is a good little in, lead melody that just climaxes yeah. the song nicely. Yeah, and it keeps it. It doesn't, it doesn't need to go anywhere else other than where it goes. Yeah, it's not an indulgent solo. It's like right, let's just this fits the song perfectly. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, and it goes nicely back into the chorus. So now. Leading on nicely into the sing. Was this? It's not the tower, weren't I? Don't think. Single? No, Killing Floor. Killing Floor was. There was two videos made. I can't remember what it was. It was Killing Can Floor was the only single. Well, single. We'll have to look it up, but there was. I'm sure there's two. But I am. Um... Might be for Gates of Your Eyes, and but yeah. But no, but I, yeah, I, I, I love really this song. Up, you talk about. The tower. Yeah, I mean, I, I love this song. The way the the bass, the bass and drum intro. It's um, it's, it's such a simple bass line, but it's so effective, and it just carries the song. You know, you've got the drums around it, and then the guitars kick in, and then uh, you know, with that melody, and it, it's just a brilliant way to start the song. And it's it's a complete, it's a changer from what we've had coming before it as well. They did do a video for the tower. I oh, did. Yeah, the one for Killing Floor and one for the Tower. Um, one of them as well is like a Killing Floor. I remember is uh, it kind of reenacts the restaurant scene from Monty Python's Life of Brian, not Life of Brian, uh, Meaning of Life. Oh right, yeah. And um, in a sort of gothic, rocky kind of way, where Bruce Dickinson <laughs> plays the waiter putting like bread rolls on people's tables, and uh, the devil's in the background. He's running the restaurant, and yeah, it's a bit of a comedy number it's quite a funny good video actually uh, yeah i mean we i we've said that the uh tears of a dragon is the uh, greatest iron maiden not greatest song i made and never recorded um i think this is takes a close second actually yeah. i think this is a perfect yeah i think this is a total that to maiden <laughs> this song um 
and don't tell me again. Then there must have been some subtle. Yeah, this will piss them off. Oh, of course um, it was. It did, because it's even got shit, uh, even to... Harris would have loved to have wrote a bass like this. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, I don't think the Tribe of Gypsy guys were, you know, yeah, we we we're, we're taking on Iron Maiden. I think they were paying homage to Iron Maiden. Of I think they that, were without Maiden, they they probably grown up listening. Yeah, to they were having the time of their lives at the moment. Going, yeah. quite, couldn't, I bet they couldn't believe their luck. No, that's and, it. Um, yeah, I think they were trying to just write a great Maiden esque metal song, and that's what they've done perfectly. I mean, again, that do do do, you know. Yeah. Perfect bass line. Oh, it's brilliant. Fantastic riffs. I mean, that. Yeah, yeah, the melody when it comes in. Yeah, it's brilliant. And then it's one of, it's just a perfect song where just everything just locks in. Everything yeah. just comes together. It does. Everything's interwoven wonderfully. Fantastic vocal lines. Fantastic chorus. Lovers in it, but backed up perfectly. You know. With the drums and the and the riffs just lock in together, it's got a fantastic sort of bouncy groove to it with a memorable melody over the top. Yeah, it's just, and then you just have that fantastic breakdown with that. Dun, 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 oh, it's dun, quite dun, heavy, dun, isn't it? Dun, Without dun, no dun, harmonics dun, coming in, yeah. Yeah, even Zach Wilde would have been happy with that. Yeah, and um, I know that's a dirty word. Let's not go there. Yeah, um, he's a cunt, but he, yeah. he can play guitar, you know. So yeah. okay, and um. I've not, I'm not related to him. You can take him <laughs> before you like. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just everything. It's just a, a modern, crunchy, heavy. Yeah, it's, it's, heavy it's a modern made song, basically. Yeah, it's what made them sound like like if they'd allowed themselves to be influenced by the nineties. Yeah, and again, I think you know. If they if they did stuff like this with Blaze, I don't even think. Um, well, I guess we could go into that with the uh, yeah, Blaze we'll, episode, yeah. but yeah, you we'll, know, we'll get there, won't we? Yeah, a, a track like this just thrown in. This is what we said about the X Factor, wasn't it? It was like as great yeah. as this is, just a couple of little four minutes just to break things up a little bit. Because yeah, the B sides would have gone handily on. Because that is a bit of a album. dark journey. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic song. So yeah, we're uh, we're chugging along nicely, aren't we? Chemical yeah. Wedding and the Tower, and then straight into um, the Killing Floor, which is probably let's face it, the heaviest song about Satan you're ever going to hear. Because that chorus, Satan, it's like you know, fucking. You, I, they even get like a guy doing those vocals as well. And yeah, who's um, looking the credits is someone. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm on the. Uh, I would like to see. It. I'd like to say it's someone that did other stuff, but he's he's got nothing. Yeah, it's Frazik MC, the Guru, Willie Six Six Six, and Craig Lichtenstein. Background vocals on track four. So I'm guessing that's someone. It's got to be Tribe of Gypsy Boys, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, probably thinking of it. Yeah. Yeah, Glenn Benton weren't available that day. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. But no, nah, I mean this is um, and this is the first um, first song Adrian Smith put down for the album as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, but I like the um, I like the way it starts, but also I like that guitar melody that comes in just over the top of it. Down, 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 down. It's quite quite a weird one. It's sort of you've got the main riff, and then just for it dissolves into the core, uh, into the main riff itself, like the main verse. Yeah. You get a nice little guitar melody that's got Adrian Smith written all over it. Do you, you remember the quiet bit? Yeah, so, just before the car, I so said, ding, 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 ding. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's just there, but then it's um, and it's almost his... you almost don't notice it, but it's just there. It's like subliminal messaging sort of thing. It's like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, no, I think this is this is a fantastic song. Yeah. Um, again, nice crunchy fit. Like it's, it's not even sort of like a riff. It's more just um, power calls. You know. Yeah. And um, it just trudges along nicely and uh yeah i love that that again it's so dark and atmospheric when um oh, yeah, it is. The yeah atmosphere, so, uh, atmosphere and then it just goes slightly place. quiet with a real sinister sort of play on the guitar where he says sleeping eyes awake to yeah. see hooded gaze whispers in the wind the darker yeah. side of ecstasy and then, and then oh. 
Bang, we're back in, in sack. There, of course. Yeah, it's, it's proper, isn't it? Like you say, it's Glenn Benton time. Yeah. And um, and I've got it on from a pretty reliable source that, um, yeah, the whole death metal thing, Bruce can't stand it. He hates them. Oh, right. The fact that he's got them on this song is... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, but obviously it suits, it's not quite death metal, but it's it's on the extreme, isn't it? And it suits the song, so... Yeah, I mean, again, with the death metal thing, I think uh, Bruce has basically just said, like, love the music, just don't get the vocals. And, yeah. And not only that, they uh, they don't really... It's like, yeah, cool. Now now what? You've done it. Now what, now what, what do you do, yeah. sort of thing. But um, And I remember Dio, as well around this time, I think it was around this time, it was in his... 90s might have been slightly before when he put out an album uh da, da, da. yeah it's uh strange highways and um if you an interview from that time is like yeah i'm listening to bands like Kong and napalm death <laughs> it's like and yeah it, a million miles what i'm doing but I'm, I'm liking what they've done with it and um yeah he's sitting there kind of like, talking That's about how good napalm death are it's mad isn't it uh, you know, like the Godfather sort of thing. It's you know? like, how can I apply this to, this to what, what yeah. I've done without, like, just just tweaking the formula to fit in with what was going on? And I thought that was really cool. But then again, I mean, Napalm Death, they did that, what's referred to as their um, 90s period, where they had a lot more in common with sort of like your God fleshes and your fear batteries. I mean, if you get, uh, yeah, Fear, Emptiness, Despair, that was uh, produced by Colin Richardson. And like, look at the artwork, for fuck's sake. It's yeah, straight out yeah. of Machine Head yeah. territory. Um, if you ever saw Diatribes. That's, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I know that yeah, one. Yeah, it's one of the only ones I do know. Yeah. And uh, these two as well. You know, again, it's, it's referred to as the 90s period where they lost all the thing. And went, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. It's like, what, so they actually wrote songs, you mean? Yeah, that's it, like, yeah. They they play a bit with groove. They slightly, ever so slightly, mix with industrial a little bit. Yeah. But industrial was massive at the time. Of course it was. You know, nine and, uh, and fucking uh, ministry and all that were all over the big place. Big emphasis on groove on those albums. But even then, it was like, yeah, but they were still Napalm Death. Yeah. That's that was it. still heavier than anything that was out. Yeah. That's the at thing. The time, just you know, broadening their horizons. They still blew Coal Chamber off the fucking stage yeah. when. Well, it's <laughs> like it's the same with Diabolus and Musica. I mean, yeah, precisely, uh, yeah. You know, it's still Slayer. Yeah. They tuned down and slowed it down a touch, and it still blew most other fucking bands away that time. Yeah, yeah. But that, that album gets a pasting. Mm. But you know, fucking people. <laughs> Heavy metal would be fucking great if it wasn't for the fans. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, Killing Floor, fantastic yeah. Oh, song. Yeah, great. Um, um, we're rocking. I think we are. And it King leads us into things nice and rolling. It's leading us in for me what is up there with Tears of the Dragon as Bruce Dickinson's greatest ever solo song in the Book of Thel. What a fucking song this is. And the yeah. test, it's the reason it's in the middle of the album as well. It's like, hello, centerpiece, have this. Yeah. And where it starts off all mellow, you know, the fucking. You know, all the fucking nice mellow that intros. Sounds to me like it's a piano. It could be a it piano. It does, yeah. And you've got the, 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 the widdly suck it, you know, the lead bit over the top of it and all the atmosphere, the atmosphere and all that. Then all of a sudden it's like dun 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 dun. Yeah. Dun 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 dun. dun you know, proper fucking heavy. And you go through that again and it just kicks in with this fucking this main riff. Yeah, this fantastic dun, 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 dun. And it's so groovy as well. You talk about groove. There's definitely it's groove. That's a borderline fresh riff as well. Like you can do play yeah. that. Dan, 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 dan. You know, it's like a. I'm trying to think who. Uh... I mean, that main riff. If you take the drumming, like just that main. Dan, 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 dan. Dave Mustaine would have been proud to have wrote yeah. that. Big time. You know, and um, but again, you've got like a bit of a gallopy rhythm underneath it, and, yeah, and yeah. the song just keeps it just keeps building and building, it just yeah. adds layer upon layer as it gets into that, that pre chorus, don't you? Yeah, back inside the temple with the Booker's Fell is opening, you know, yeah. the, the priestess stands before you, cupping her hands as she's rising. I think are the words I might be yeah. wrong. Then it kicks into the chorus, which just fucking soars to another level, doesn't it? Yeah, 
there's a lot of with this whole alchemy thing as well there's a lot of rituals involved as well because you, you get yeah. into sort of masonry and oh yeah um, stuff yeah. and then you get into secret societies and yeah, yeah that's another that's, that's a can of worms isn't it there it's a yeah that's a but um yeah loads of fucking weird stuff goes on but um this just conjures all that stuff up, doesn't it? You yeah, know, like that film Eyes Wide, Eyes Wide Shut. Do you ever yeah. see that? I haven't seen it, but no, I know. That, I know you film, get yeah. the imagery of the yeah. people with the masks and the robes yeah. and, you know, and uh, again, the um, structured houses that are, you know, centuries old and there's an old library in the back and a secret room. Just drink <laughs> this. And yeah, that's it, yeah. All the secrets are going to be revealed to you, and um, and you'll go insane when you learn them all. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that just conjures this up, doesn't it? It's brilliant. Yeah, it yeah the whole atmosphere of the entire album is, is like that, and he, he's captured it well. And it proves that it's not only Steve, it's not only Steve Harris who can capture a, a period of time yeah. in music. And then you've got this big sort of thing, and then right at the end, you get an extra treat total nerd out at the end it just comes back to that main yeah. you missed out you've you've glossed over the best no the best i've not i'm going song. there oh i've well, gone the um the, the bass in the load where it yes. hangs out with the power call yeah and then uh, eddie casillas comes in and it kicks in yes. oh, it's fucking it's, the solo section is just insane Mm. And, you, um, and actually, you see, he, uh, the bass player got a writing credit on this, so you know full well he, he's come up with that bit. He's yeah. gone like, "Lads, can I play this bit, please?" Yeah. You know? And um, but that just sends a song off with the solos, with both of them whittling away, and then oh, yeah, well, back it, in. The song sort of reduces down, and then it just builds up again. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, all this chaos and everything gets drummed up, and then right then, and that's the thing as well. It's kind of like it builds up this sort of. You know those sort of films where um, you know someone stumbles across something, a bit like Number of the Beast in a way. Someone stumbles across something they shouldn't, and they end up in this, you know, nightmare. And then it all just gets reduced, and it, 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 they escape and the thing. And then it's almost as if nothing had happened. Yeah. And then you're like, well, what was that all about? But then they've left. There's a little sign. It's like, no, it was real. Yeah. Or maybe it's a dream, or maybe I've, I've yeah. And then it's all over. But then there's this little thing of, what? Well, no, nah, it happened. And we know you are, you know, sort yeah. of thing. <laughs> it's a like phantasm. Remember those films? And um, Fuck hell, yeah. really eerie atmosphere in, in that first one, especially. And uh, and then, yeah, it just boils down again to that main bit at the beginning. Boils down. And then you've got this fantastic spoken word. Spoken place, word, yeah. By... When it comes to who invented heavy metal, this guy always gets overlooked. Uh, Arthur Brown. Yeah, it's Arthur Brown, Brown, isn't it? Yeah. Arthur Brown. And that fantastic song, Fire. Yeah. And if you, and you's watching this, go on to, if you can find, I think it was 1969, is the crazy world of Arthur Brown doing Fire on top of the Pops. And that must have freaked kids out at the time. And so, <laughs> if you look at what ghosts are doing now, the band are all in robes. You don't you don't yeah. see the faces. They're still, he's in a robe. He's got this makeup on his face. It's black and white. He's got this thing on his head with fire coming out of it. And then right at the end, he throws the robe off, and he's got all these cryptic symbols and paintings all over him. And then all these people um, jump up, and like there's dancers and everything. Fucking crazy. And it, I mean, it's not metal. I mean, it's it's mainly no, like organ and bass and yeah. things. It's not a riff in it, but the aesthetics, the imagery of it. He surely Alice Cooper was taking notes and yeah, yeah, a big time. All the rest of it, but yeah, the um, he was well ahead of his time. I mean, yeah, that must have been a Doctor Who kids running behind the sofa moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Probably black and white shit. as well, which makes it like it's just even cooler. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that guy was fucking crazy. Um, I saw him as well once. Um, I saw Alice Cooper. It wasn't that long ago, but oh fucking hell, yeah, it's a few years ago now at the Alexandra Palace, and it was a Halloween concert. 
And he finished the set, and then at the encore, he says, um, since we're in England and it's Halloween, and it can't ever be Halloween without this man, please welcome to the stage Mr. Arthur Brown. And he came out <laughs> full makeup. Oh, yeah. guy's in his yeah. 70s now. Fucking fire coming out of his head. And yeah, he did fire <laughs> with Alice Cooper, and that was cool. I bet that was quality, mate. Yeah. The fact that Alice Cooper just, he just stood back and just, every so often just went, fire. <laughs> he just did the backing vocals. This yeah. guy took over, and he was leaping around the stage and everything. And he yeah, and doesn't his voice just sound fucking amazing? I mean, yeah. if there was, you could easily see him doing a, um, you know, as much as Christopher Lee playing Saruman in yeah. um, Lord of the Rings. He could definitely do the voice in like an audio book, or if they did it as an oh, animated yeah, film. Yeah, yeah, you could. You could definitely see. I don't know why he didn't do more spoken word um, acting in, yeah, it, be it audio books or voices for cartoon, because this sounds fantastic. The way he's just pronounced his pronunciation and his timing, and just, uh, yeah, it just sounds brilliant, his voice. And he turns up later as well. Yeah, he does, yeah, a couple more times. So, um, moving on to the uh, Gates of Your Eyes, and which yeah, I but, think um, drops the dro drops the level right down, doesn't it? It's uh, like yeah, but I think it um, it fits the song quite nicely. Oh no, I'm not. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm saying it's, it's no, it works works perfectly, but it takes us right down because we've been building and we've built yeah. to a fucking crescendo with the Gates of Fell that they couldn't possibly go anywhere after unless it was right away back down. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. nice, nice chilled song, you know. Still nice fucking slow number just to get us back in the thing, me and reset ourselves. And um, you know, it's it's a it's a great song again. Yeah, the um again it's I still find this a very dark song. As much as it's mellow, it's still got just yeah. a real yeah dark atmosphere to it. As above, so below. That's the um the Baphomet statue. The, you know the fucking uh, the uh, thing with the goat head. Yeah, yeah. His arms, ones like that, and um, the yeah. other one. Yeah, that that stands for as above, so below. Um, it's um. I'm just looking at what it actually fucking means. It's um. It's obviously it's William Blake, as we know. Apparently, Urizen is the embodiment of conventional reason and law. Yeah, everyone knows that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, fucking hell, it's um, fuck me. <laughs> but really, really lovely guitar on this. Oh yeah, uh, it's just again like... that little bit before the we go to the chorus was that just a ding, 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 ding. Yeah, ding. yeah, lovely. No, it's it's fucking it is awesome, and it's it's yeah, no. it's the perfect, the perfect. I know we like this word on this show, but the perfect palate cleanser. We just uh. Yeah. We've gone to that place, right? We need to reset. Well, it feels right? like, you know, book. it's the start of part two of a story. If yeah. Anything, right? you it is. He actually, they actually played this live. And this was like track four. Mm. This was like the fourth song in a set. It's like fucking hell, you know? The, That's a pretty good set, actually, um, on the Screen, screen For Me Brazil live album. Yeah. And um, you get that on Infology as well. Yeah, yeah. I've still, still got them. I'm going to sit uh, down and watch that. It's a shorter... It's an a it's I think the the um on the DVD you only get about nine songs, but it is the visual yeah. of that album. Yeah, yeah. And uh but yeah, yeah, wonderful song. Um not quite up there with uh what was the really nice ballad on um, Change of Heart. No. Change of Heart's very oh, good. And Man of Sorrows. Man of Sorrows, that's it. Yeah, quite Kind of fits in nicely with yeah, that. Yeah, but when you when you've got two songs of that quality, you're going to struggle to fucking to yeah. keep that quality, aren't you? But it is a it is a standout on this yes. album. Yes, no, no, it is. It's a great song, and it doesn't really overplay it, is it? Because you could really. No, it's I mean, quite it's short. Not... It's um, I'm saying about four minutes, isn't it? Um, four yeah, it's under four minutes. Oh, that's just over four minutes. Sorry. Yeah, but I mean, it does kind of build up but it doesn't have too much of a bombastic you know they they don't really do that although it does build up and kind of 
climax is at the end. It's not. It doesn't overplay it. It's not like a typical ballad, so to speak. And then uh, next we have a musical rendition of uh, yeah. one of the greatest uh, English hymns. Yeah, Jerusalem. Yeah, the, uh, a much better version as well than the Emerson, Lake and Palmer. <laughs> um, have you ever heard that album, by the way? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, I no, I can't say I have, but I know uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer, so it's a brain salad. What's it called? Right. Brain salad. I've got it here. With the HR Giger. Here we go. Mm. Uh, brain brain salad surgery. Oh, All right. Yeah, it opens up with a rendition of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, fucking hell, mate! But next time you uh, do your drumming workout, stick that bastard on. Yeah. I'll yeah. That'll, that'll, uh, that'll run your arms out. So. Oh, yeah. Right with them. <laughs> yeah, Michael Portnoy is like it's pong for him. <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy album. But um, yeah, that opens up with uh, Jerusalem. But yeah, it's not as good as this. No, it wouldn't be, would it? Yeah, I, I, I think this is really good. I mean, oh, obviously, it it's quite it mad that you've, quite got, you've got a load of fucking uh, Latin Latino Americans playing on it. You know, <laughs> making it what it is. Yeah, I mean, I feel quite patriotic listening to it, but oh, apparently, time, yeah. um, that wasn't what Bruce was going for. No, of course, was, he's, uh, not, he's not jingoistic at all, is he? But but no, no. It, it should make you feel patriotic because it's it's written about a time when you know when people weren't afraid to be proud of where they fucking come from and there's quite this, yeah I'm trying, to, I'm trying to avoid getting too topical because one it's we want this to be timeless and two i don't want us to get cancelled but um <laughs> but no i mean you know there's it's, a, it a warning fucking, in it yes, as well. England, fucking you know yeah but there's a um it's about as well i mean there's like all great poems you can look at different sections and look at thing but one was um there's the uh dark satanic mills and what he was saying was this is just at the edge of the uh, industrial revolution and apparently like there's factories going up where they were kicking out the smoke and that it ruined the um the view of the countryside right yeah and what he said was it was when you look in upon you know these green and pleasant lands and um, you look at thing, but then there's this on on the horizon. You see the the smog, the smog and of yeah. course how that would look as the um, during the sunset, uh, yeah. it would colorize everything. And he said it was like a a warning of something oncoming, something in, yeah impending, and, yeah. And um, he didn't like the way it looked, and he said like as much as this is gonna, you know, what this is gonna bring with it, it's also gonna bring a lot of uh, other disadvantages shall we say yeah. and um lots of different ways you can look at that but yeah that those dark satanic meals i thought was a great way of uh putting it really yeah no I mean, it is um you know short and sweet but it is is a fucking is a great you know great poem isn't it it's um but yeah no i mean and this is you know this is Six minutes, 42 seconds of, of brilliance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I've never heard a better version of this. Yeah. Um, and just with the, so that we've taken the thing, let's analyze the music a little bit, because I think the fact that they're going, oh yeah, look, they're doing Jerusalem. Yeah. It's, um, that does kind of overshadow the, uh, the music because he could have easily have just been this damn off. Yeah. And wrote some lyrics and, um, it would have worked just as well. I think, um, but so the fact that he chose to put those lyrics in is great. But yeah, the, the, there's a good little. Um, what's the, what am I trying to say? The music's really good. Yeah, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, perfect. It's a nice little structure. companion piece. That was the word I was looking yeah. for. It's a nice, it's a nice little companion piece with Gates of Horizon as well. It continues mm. that vibe before we get back into the fucking monstrously heavy shit that comes yeah. after. Yeah, yeah. Rather than this was just well. The album sort of just explodes into life, rolls on, 
with uh, King and Crimson, and then you've got the you know setting the tone with Chemical Wedding. Then we're rocking out with the tower. Then we're getting really heavy and with again, Killing Slaw. Killing Slaw. Yeah. Climax with Book of Phil. Yeah. Hell. Book yeah, of Phil. Yeah. Um, and then, so it's like a end of part one. That's the dev, you know climax. Yeah. And then we opening up the second scene with uh, Gates of Your Eyes and this nice, beautiful, melodic, atmospheric song. And then we've got the thing with Jerusalem, again, that builds up nicely. You know, you've got that kind of medieval feeling to it with that. You know, the way it just yeah. builds up dun, 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 as it goes up and, you know. And then, right, <laughs> we've built yeah. you up some more. That's it. Fancy some more metal? Well, here we go. Yeah. Dun, 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 oh, yeah, dun, dun, dun. it did fucking, this yeah. is definitely uh one of the heaviest on the album. Yeah, it's a great riff and it's a great drum drum pattern as well to go with it. And you can tell why they opened the live set with it. Yeah, because you could have the light. You could have the lights down. The lights. The lights. You know, you could really fucking really start. How did they open with it? Did they just sort of? Yeah, no, it didn't. But that's what you could do now. Think about it. You could have the lights really reacting with the riffs and that. Normally, you just have the band opening, and all of a sudden, Bruce just Bruce runs, runs out like on, maniac. Yeah. one foot on the drum stool, splits yeah. in midair, David Lee Roth style. Yeah, and then sort of grabs the mic and tries not to knock it over as he yeah. tries not to fall yeah. off the yeah. stage. And typical yeah. Bruce Dickinson stuff. Yeah, but, um, yeah, what a great song! And again, I'm I'm repeating myself, but it all builds up to that soaring chorus. Yeah, oh no, the, the chorus is amazing. Mm. When you got the old like almost a galloping riff, I mean, you know, it's a this is well fits in with the time, like that nineties, yeah, emphasis on groove. That people, yeah, because yeah, you know, it's you know, obviously Pantera had brought groove to the forefront. Machine had carried it on, but this is this is marrying the eighties metal with the nineties groove, and it's. I tell like, you, who would have been proud to write this riff? Tommy Victor. Yeah, I can see that. This is a yeah. This is a um, this is easy could have been on a prong album. Yeah, big time. You know. Yeah. And then rolling around, and that's one thing Tommy's really good at is finding a. You know the way like Walk it evolves around that one riff and it comes yeah. back to it. You know, Tommy Victor's quite good at that. He yeah, gets, he's a master like, that, that one roof and then working around it and bringing yeah. it back in. Is the main well, it's hook. Another one who similar to him who doesn't get the love is is Paige from from Helmet. They're very similar. Paige Hamilton, yeah. yeah, yeah. With their with their, their like their crunchy riffs and their sim simplistic, but not. I'm not using that as a as a derogatory term. It's just no, bringing it back to Helmet, the fucking. Uh, just keep I it think, going, you know. Yeah, Helmet. That uh, people didn't quite know what to do with them because they were they kind of came out in the nineties with that hodgepodge. They weren't. Yeah. They were too heavy to be grunge. Yeah, they weren't quite heavy enough to be metal, but they yeah. had that. Oh, they had did. Yeah, that was, that was a weird one. Yeah, no, that was yeah. weird. I mean, I've only got I've got two of their albums. Um, I think it's the main ones: Mean Time and Betty. Yeah, and obviously the song that broke was Milk Toast, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, was, great you know, song. Yeah. Great song. Yeah, I've, uh, I need to. Dive a bit deeper with him actually and see if any other of their stuff was good. I mean, he, he Pedro Hamilton got into um, writing soundtracks and stuff, didn't he? Uh, Did he? Oh, yeah. yeah, he started writing scores for films and things like that. So, uh, probably made some actual money as well. Good yeah, luck to him. Yeah. <laughs> he did a uh, tour as well, didn't they, recently, Helmet? Um, it was something like 30, oh, fucking hell, was it 30 years? Yeah. It was like 30 mm. years, 30 songs. So, it was like a oh, right. career retrospective spanning the whole thing over 30 songs and something like that it was like cool little mad I'm taking that one uh, um, was it just those two albums though i'm not sure yeah yeah <laughs> i, I think well didn't frankie, frankie bello from anthrax uh joined them for a little while as well didn't he yeah. in the late 2000s okay now. yeah yeah he came back in the band when they did the whole reunion thing with joey but yeah, he he actually um, left for a little while and, and joined Helmet, and F Joey Vera from Armored Saint jumped in on Anthrax. Oh right, that would have been, you know, he's no slouch either. You know, no, no. going from Frankie Bell to Joey Vera, it wouldn't have. Uh, yeah. 
but uh, yeah, it, that's uh, something worth looking into. Actually, I yeah. think you've uh, sparked something there. I might have to dig yeah, them, cool. dust off right. those two <laughs> CDs, and get in. Yeah, them. that's what I'm here uh, for. Spark yeah. some ideas. So yeah, Trumpets of Jericho, a nice. It's cooking quite a long song actually. It's nearly six minutes long. I didn't realise yeah. that. Yeah, no, it's, it, you'd think listening to it, it should be a short one. It should be a three, mm. four minute. And I think, in honesty, it probably could be. You get to yeah. a point, I think actually I do remember listening to it. You get to around four minutes, four minutes, ten. You've just repeated the chorus again. But then they go back into it, I think. And yeah. it's like, no, I'm thinking of Machine Men. Oh, all right. But I think I'd imagine you could probably say the same about Trumpets Jericho. It's quite a... It doesn't need to be six minutes. No. I do think there's a pretty good solo in Trumpets of Jericho as well, though, if I remember correctly. I'm trying to think. It's around this time in the album, but there's a solo. And it's just like, fucking hell, this is awesome. <laughs> it's a beast. Probably is this. It's the song, song. It's between, the song that demands Between a solo. Roy and Adrian, you're not going to get yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. you're not really going to get a bad exactly. one. Um, but yeah, moving on. Um, I will slightly agree with you here. I mean, I guess things do take a, ever so slight dip, but I do yeah, think... Yeah, this um, is where we're, we're meeting what I said earlier. We've gone for... It started off a bit rockily in the middle. It's like, fucking hell, here we go. But then the last, it sort of dips out at the end. And because Machine Man's a bit of shit because this is the other song Adrian Smith contributes to the album. Yeah, and but again... The song is... The song itself doesn't really do a whole lot, but the chorus is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say, the worst song on this album is, yes. is you know, yeah. I'd you love know, to have written a song as good as the worst song on this. You yeah, know, it's no, I'm saying only... the, the guitar melody is it's, it's like off another fucking, it's on another level. I mean, it is like... It's like this will piss the, uh, you know socialist people off but um the uh in the billionaires club the millionaire serves the coffee yeah and yeah, yeah if, 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 if the if machine men is as bad right, as this yeah. album gets then yeah we're, we're good you know yeah yeah that's it so um yeah I, right. I, 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 but definitely, cool, um, definitely the before an end kicks in yeah is, is, uh, yeah, but when the main riff comes in, it's a bit of a da 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 yeah. plodder. Yeah, but on, again, it's only because we've had a quite a bit. We're comparing it to the rest of the album, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's got, like, say, the, the the guitar melody in the chorus is fucking hell. I mean, it's just and so it's this actually the solo in this. I think is really good. Yeah, I think this one might be the one. Actually, I'm just bringing it up now. Wow. Yes, this is it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah there's a real it's bit like, of widdly widdly yeah, bit. Of... Yeah, yeah. It's, um... and then you've got that nice little bit at the end. That da Yeah. Is this a, does it have a whoa 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 with it as well? It does, and that's when it probably doesn't need that. Yeah. Oh, oh, like you tag. can't not have it though. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big fan life. of the whoa. What's the fucking point? I'm a big fan of whoa whoa whoa's. Yeah. I think you know. You, you can they they never not work <laughs> yeah, and they always work live i mean they, they bon jovi fucking his house is built with them <laughs> yeah his house fucking hell he's 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 a state yeah yeah but you know what i mean the um that's a, <laughs> that's a saying that um, paul stanley said to someone i think someone said oh the new album is really he said, "I ain't doing, man." He went, oh, "He went. The new album's getting a bit of a fucking shit reviews in the press. I don't know what like. It's getting pretty bad." And uh, to Paul said, "I mean, oh, don't don't worry about it. You know, they, yeah. It, my house is built on ba- with bad reviews. <laughs> well, that was a good little. Yeah, that's, no, that's, a, that's a Dolly Parton uh, yeah. thing there. But yeah, and um, Paul John Stanley, bon, if you have, bon have you ever house that, is built on whoa, whoa, whoa's." Yeah. You ever noticed how Paul Stanley sounds like Dorothy out of Golden Girls? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Fucking one. You never see him in the same place, do you? Yeah. Yeah. The um, Do you remember I said about Ralph Vieira? He, yeah. um, he does a couple of different 
YouTube channels, one for Sabbath, one for yeah. Kiss, and one. That's it, yeah. And he does a podcast as well. And there was they were talking about Paul Stanley once. <laughs> I think they were reviewing a Kiss album, and they were, I think they disagreed on a song. It's like, no, I really like this one. He went, oh well, doesn't matter. I'll agree to disagree. And then he went, some people like steak, some people like cheesecake. <laughs> Like, and he did it perfectly. perfectly yeah. you know, <laughs> some people like it, some people don't. Uh, yeah. yeah, fucking fair play to him. Still going. Still going. And yeah, he um he uh, he manages to do the Gene Simmons thing without pissing everyone off. He's just as rich as Gene. Don't get yeah, off. That's shit. it, but yeah, but block. he doesn't try he doesn't try to copyright air, like what he <laughs> said. Or water. Someone should. <laughs> So, but, um, but yeah, I mean, and right, we're we're at the end, the Alchemist, which I've got a statement for you. It might piss you off, might not. This could have been on load. <laughs> oh, you're musically. You're of... Musically, it's something. It's like it sounds like um, Outlaw Torn or Fixer off of Reload. It's got that yeah. weird, weird sort of jammy sort of vibe to it. It doesn't really fit with the rest of the album. But I mean, the song's a bit of a hotchpotch because it it sort Sorry, of replies. Sorry, my dad just rang me. I was just texting him. I'll ring you back in a sec. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The song, the music. There, this could have been off. It, it sounds like the Outlaw Torn or Fixer, off of Load and Reload. Yeah, got that weird sort of jammy, weird vibe going on. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, "Fucking hell!" I've, I've skipped albums. But this song's a bit of a mishmash because it's it's got that reprise of the Chemical Wedding in it, isn't it? Yeah, which I think is a great way just to close. A little, little callback, yeah. But um, this this is what um, Parkway Drive did this on Horizons. The title track Horizons was the last track on the album, but track number five, they actually played a few bars from the, the song in it, like used yeah. the riff, but just changed it slightly, a bit like this does. And it's almost like you're like, fucking hell, hang on, I've, I've heard this, because it's, it's the Chemical Wedding, but just in a slightly different key. Yeah. And you're like, oh, hang about. And then I twigged what they were doing. And it was gradually morphing it in. And it was, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. But it's, the album could do without it. Oh, foot's asleep. Yeah. The, um, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't, it, you could have ended the album with Trumpets of Jericho and boom, you've got, you've got a fucking, an old timer. Yeah, you, you do tend to do that, but. A lot of we'd be having a lot of albums that had six songs on them. <laughs> no, so, but you're, just, you're talking eight songs, and because the album's fifty. I suppose back in the day, what is this? Fifty-five minutes. Fifty-seven minutes. Yeah. So you take yeah. off Machine Men and the Alchemist. Is that fifty-seven including the bonus tracks? No, no, no. no it's, yeah, it's fifty-five minutes with the ten tracks. Um, yeah, because uh, the Alchemist on on Spotify and the reissue is only like five and a half minutes, six minutes, because you had like a fucking minute and a half of silence, and then him talking about a bright sandal and all this sort of shit. Yeah, that that Weird. doesn't a song kick in though. There no, it's not sorry. It's, it's a it's a two minutes of silence and there's a broke. It's a, a spoken piece. Oh, and all right. this vegetable world appeared on my left foot as a bright sandal formed in mortar of precious stones and gold. I stooped down and bound it on to walk forward through eternity. You know, it reflects your boat, but, Bruce. Yeah. yeah, but if you knock if you knock that time off, you're still left with a forty five a forty forty two forty three minute album. Yeah, all right, fair enough. More than respectable. Um, I I do think, I mean, if we're going to do that, I mean, you could maybe drop Machine Men, but yeah, um, I still think this is a good closer. I do like the way the song go, like sort of unfolds over six minutes. There's a lot going on. There's again another great solo. I think it's a good little song, and I do think the way it merges into Chemical Wedding. Yeah, you can fit that melody over. Yeah. And um, I think him just doing that as well, just it just it's just a nice little finishing touch. It just closes the brings the album to a close. I think it's a good way to shut an album, really, especially with this concept running through it. And um, I think it just caps it off nicely, to be honest. I, I think it, it's it needs to be there. Yeah, yeah and I don't mind Machine Man either. I still think that's a good song. I think yeah, so it's, it's like the weakest one. I, I would have preferred if they dropped because we're obviously moving into the realm of bonus tracks. I would have preferred um, Real World on the album instead of Machine Men, if I'm being honest. That's where we Yeah, I was going to say, they, they. I do enjoy them, 
bonus tracks you can kind of take or leave, and these are B-sides or whatnot. Yeah. But um, I do think these were meant to be off the album. I don't think they would have fit in these. I think these 10 songs flow together nicely. Oh, yeah, no, nice... the bonus tracks are... And these are... Extras. Yeah, know, they just... were meant to um, be left off. Because Com- Comfius, the, the last one, it's a fucking weird one. That's just the Bruce Dickinson nonsense piece for me. Um, not, but Not that, even better than Captain Seaman Staines or whatever. The he's... <laughs> yeah, you know, he has his moment. <laughs> yeah. I'm in a band with an Italian drummer and all that shit. Yeah. But, um, but no, um, Return of the King, it's a pretty, considering it's written by Adrian and Bruce, it's pretty piss weak, really. It don't really do, don't really do a whole lot. And um, but real world, I actually quite like that, and I'll I would swap that for Machine Men in a heartbeat. But I can see why, because Machine Men, you can almost talk about the alchemy thing where they're trying to use fucking whatever you know, dark sciences and all that sort of thing. So I can see why it's on there lyrically and and thematically. Yeah, no, I, I, I yeah, maybe I, I think that would work actually, because it's quite very it it, it 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 throws in a little bit of variation as well. I think the yeah. main problem with Machine Men, it's um, it's kind of like yeah, this fits in nicely with everything that was come before. Yeah. But this feels like a bit of repeat of what's come before. Yeah. To so chuck well, in real world, well, it, yeah. it it varies yeah. things up. It's as almost well. too, it's almost that's, two minutes shorter as well, so that's a nice short sharp shock. Yeah, I would. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I'd, I'd compromise with you there, mate, if you wanted. Yeah, if cool. I'm throw everything and swap it for real world. Yeah. And it also just gives a little bit of a real variation. Um, cool chorus as well. A real world. Yeah, yeah uh, that's, that's, I really like it know. where it goes up. Yeah, no, yeah. it's really cool. And um, obviously there's, but, the track, there's the track that's not on the um, not on the album, which is the, the cover. I don't know if you even know. They cover Scorpions, the zoo. That's well, not on this, no. No, no, it's not. They actually wrote it in this session. It only came out on um, ECW, the wrestling thing. They did a, an album. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. And it only came out on there. I only saw the light of day on there. And um, it was all the wrestlers' themes performed by bands. Okay, I mean, yeah. Um, well, Kilgore covered Walk. Um, someone covered a fucking Snap Your Fingers. Uh, Amphrax did Phantom Lord. Like um and um yeah, so the the cover Kilgore, of the zoo was on there. Weird band, weren't they? Who's that? Kilgore. I actually fucking like that album they did. The, the album. What I thought it was amazing. Can never be. What do you want me to be? Yeah. yeah, I love that album. I love it. They never got the never got the thing me they deserved. I don't think. I mean, they were a roadrunner band. They were a the product of their time. Yeah, you almost but... had that roadrunner sound, didn't you? That. Every the band second on the album label. they did, though, I mean, I never heard the full album, but the single they released was called The Zoo, and that was a fucking weird song. Yeah, no, I don't think I've ever heard it. I want to go to the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, yeah, it's just, they were weird. Odd band. Original, given that. But... Yeah, no, they didn't, no, nothing else sounded like them. So no. that's, 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 the, that's an achievement. Especially in that time when everyone was trying to sound like fucking Kong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe revisit it at some point and see how well it's aged. But yeah, no, it is. I, I recommend it, mate. I, I really like it as an album. It's um, it's quite good. But yeah, like I say, um, you'd be hard pushed to find an edition that isn't the special edition. Yeah, and I, I'm happy with these 13 songs. Um, and yeah, this is an album for me that just it's one of those albums that just works, and uh, it's. Yeah, arguably the greatest album Maiden never recorded. And it's that and it scratches that itch. If you ever were ever curious about I wonder what would happen if if they just down tuned and let rip. Yeah. If they went a bit well, no, you don't need to worry about Maiden going dark. No. They can certainly they go did. dark when they want to. They went but, dark uh, when anyone. But a nice mo- monster heavy version of yeah. Maiden. If you ever wondered what that was, then that this Scratches that itch perfectly, and, and, it, um, um, and it scratched an itch for Bruce because obviously he, when he got when he got the call from Rod, he was like up for going back. If he had any more to do, he would have gone. Um, I'm all right. So I think the 
the four albums that we got, they he did what he wanted to do. Yeah. I, Otherwise, he wouldn't have gone back because Bruce don't do nothing. You know, it, you know, he, he wouldn't have done it just for the money because he's not that sort of geezer. I don't think. No, and um, he must have been interested in what. I think the real money something. came later. I don't he's think probably we, heard something yeah. in the X Factor. And to a certain extent, the stuff on Virtual Eleven, and probably thought, right, perhaps they are now at a place where our ideas sort of come together. Whereas before, yeah. Steve was here and I was here. Well, he he says I don't, I've never listened to them, and yeah, I don't that's... listen to them now because I don't want to rip off what Boost does. I just want to do my own thing. Blaze, sorry. Bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll grant you Virtual Eleven. Virtual Eleven, he might not have been interested in. No. But no, don't tell me he didn't listen to the X Factor. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah. How can he not? Oh. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, uh, I yeah. think. And he did He did listen to fucking Virtual 11 because he played Future Real on his fucking Radio 1 Rock Show thing that he did, or Radio oh, 6, did BBC uh-huh. Radio 6 thing, yeah. He actually started it with Future Real. What did he say? Did he go? He just oh. said, oh, this is the new single from uh, from Iron Maiden. It's, it's yeah. Future Real. He didn't, didn't say anything. It was, he was say no. proper diplomatic. He was like, right, well, I'm not getting involved in any of this. I'm just oh, going to say a bit of a... Who were they then? I've never heard of them. Yeah. Well, that's, well, that name sounds familiar. Like, I could... But no, he was, he was totally diplomatic. Yeah. But, um, but no, I think he, he did what he wanted to do and he probably thought that Maiden were now at a point where they could speak musically again. Yeah. I've, well, well, we'll cover that when we get to yeah. it. But yeah, the inevitable happened and uh, the stars aligned again. Yeah. And, but, um, um, as far as as far as chemical wedding goes, though, for me it's um, it's an eight. I'm, I'm happy with that. Couple of couple of creative decisions to stop it being a nine, but an eight. But it's it's a low eight purely because King and Crimson needs starts it off badly. Well, not badly. That's the wrong term. Start doesn't start it off right, and your last two tracks sort of kill the vibe. But two to two to eight, fucking hell. I mean, you're going to be hard pushed to find a a better written or produced modern old school metal album in that period of time than this funnily enough um we actually covered this on the uh, metal show with gunny and joe and um we had the uh vocalist of the king the king is blind and um and he was saying that um around this time Check out The King Is Blind, by the way. I'm not sure what they're up to lately. Um, but they're from Essex. Great bands. Uh, the guitarist actually played on the first uh, Cradle of Filth album. He was in Enmity. Do you remember them? <laughs> Fucking hell, yeah. Yeah. And um, Steve Tovey, that's it. I knew it was Steve. I didn't want to I didn't want to say and get his surname wrong. I've not spoke to him in ages. Hopefully he sees this. And yeah, where you been, mate? But um, yeah, two fantastic albums that they put out. Um, Our Father, and then uh, We Are the Parasite, We Are the Cancer. And um, he was saying, he he wrote for Terrorizer for a few years as well, Steve. And he was saying when this album came out, it was was just great to hear about, like, solos were just pissed on at the time. Yeah, they were. Solos on this. And he said it just felt great listening to a classic, you know, the formula of a classic heavy metal album. In the modern, but, but yeah, drag kicking and screaming into yeah. the modern fucking modern and he age. He said yeah. it, it, was, it was just the two worlds just met perfectly, and he said, "Yeah, this was a great album when it came out, and it was um, it was a bit of an unsung classic in his uh, in his eyes." And uh, yeah, but yeah, definitely check them out. King is blind, great band. But yeah, uh, to me, it's uh, not quite ten out of ten. Let's not get carried away either. Maybe a nine, uh, nine and a half, but it is one of my favourite albums. Objectively speaking, it might probably is a bit more of an eight, but to me, yeah, it's nine. Yeah, it's, it's, those albums that mean a lot to you. You're going to score them higher. Yeah, it? it's so. one of those albums. I don't know why it, it hurt. It, it hit me just at the right time and just made a real impression on me. And uh, I find it a real effortless listen. It's an album that just plays itself. So, yeah. I think we've just about covered everything. What yeah. do you think? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's done. Yeah, and obviously we're uh, we're about to get in the meat of it because, like you said, 
all roads have led to this point. Yeah, um, we've next week we've got to be we're going to be doing Battle Zone, um, <laughs> Feel My Pain, and uh, we're going to be Th- doing Feel Who's week. Pain, mine. <laughs> and uh, well, oh, Psycho Motel second album was the one for me that I struggled with. <laughs> um, I've got a soft spot for that. So, what else was there? There's Skunk Works was a good album, but I was quite eager to get onto Accident of Birth. Yeah, it's just one of those ones we've got to get through, really. We've got to cover it all. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going to be doing the uh, we're going to be doing a little bonus episode called The Blaze Question, where we're going to analyse what exactly went wrong and how what could have could yeah. it have worked, and yeah, maybe you know, we're gonna we're just going to explore the alternate universe. Yeah, because so, uh, so, somewhere, uh, somewhere in one of them alternate fucking Marvel universe timelines, Blaze Bailey's still the singer of Iron Maiden. Yeah, and um, we'll see what that is. But yeah, you know, it might not have happened. They yeah. could have, uh, you know, millions, millions has been put on the table for Skid Row to reform with Sebastian yeah, no, Bach. Right. They've gone, no. Yeah. That guy did something. He's Sebastian, fucking... Sebastian's yeah. a cunt, and I don't want nothing to do with it. Yeah, so oh, yeah. there is um, Jerry Jerry Doyle. Was that his name? His name's Doyle uh, from the Misfits. It was uh, getting because Doyle and uh, Jerry only. That's it, Jerry Doyle. Jerry only and Doyle from the Misfits are brothers, and um, getting the reunion with Danzig. It, the, he said the problem is Jerry and Danzig. And Doyle had guested. With, um, he, he came out with Danzig a couple of times, did like a quick Misfits set. Yeah. And he, he said, he went, the, the problem, he went, I've done this bit. That's, you know, put yeah. it out there. He went, it's, it's getting my brother and Glenn to talk. And he said the fucking, this was a great line. He went, this is the only industry where people can't put their differences aside in order to make millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's it, isn't it? There's no, and it's true. How many no people do you work with it, you know? that you actually like? You know, yeah. you, you just get on, don't you? Yeah. Because you've got a job to do. But yeah. That's it. But no, and no, yeah. that could have happened. Bruce could have yeah. shagged someone's girlfriend or wife or whatever. You know, I reckon that's what happened with Skid Row, you know. I so reckon it's got to be something, isn't it? I reckon Sebastian was, was naughty. You, you know, know you? it's got to be something like that, hasn't yeah. it? It's got to be. Because are talking, you are talking millions. Yeah. You're talking fucking arenas, aren't you? Because them, them yeah, albums... Apparently skid- the Download Festival just went... See that? That's yours. Hour and a half up there. That's all you've got to do. Yeah. And they went, nah. Not with him, I'm not. <laughs> it's a joke, isn't it? Yeah. Is that, but then uh, again, the- I thought Sebastian did a... He did a tweet, didn't he? He fucking trolled him big time. Oh, he does. He don't, he he don't went, You're on your fifth singer. Yeah. Maybe you're the ones you're the that problem. are the world. <laughs> That's it, yeah. That's it, yeah. You He's know. another one, though. He's one of those lovable, yeah. you know, rogues. <laughs> uh, I like him. and um, But no, I mean, Skid Row, those, those three albums and that EP they put out, I mean, they were fucking brilliant. I would give I would give a nut to see that line-up. Mm, yeah. You know, go back in time and see that line-up being supported by Pantera. Look, right. Um, what was it? Sebastian's doing, well, he was. He was going to yeah, do the first album. he did the first album, album didn't he? And well, he put you know out, what's coming next. Well, he put out an open call, didn't he? He said, any members of the band who want to do this with me are more than welcome. And the only one that called out was the, was the drummer because he's no longer in Skid Row. Oh, right. And he said, yeah, I'll fucking do it. So you had you had um, Rob and um, Sebastian doing that first album. That'd been great. Well, Sebastian's to- drummer in his solo band's no slouch. Yeah. If you want to try and find on YouTube their, their uh, drum solo. Oh, right. In the in his live set, it's like, oh, can you? Yeah, no, I'll yeah. check it out. But, um, no, I mean, to see Slave to the Grind in its entirety would be, uh, <laughs> it's the one, isn't it, you know? I think I'd prefer Sebastian do it as a solo act because it would then be in a smaller venue, just yeah. for my selfish. Yeah, that's it. You'd like, watching Operation yeah. Mind Crime in the underworld, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, they could do the, the first tour, festivals alone, bang. Yeah. Next year, the first, you know, first album in full, year after that, second album in full. Yeah, yeah. And they ain't got to love each other. No, that's yeah. it. No, I mean, because you're right seeing that, because anyone can play the music. It's the singer, that it's the, it's the voice that sets it yeah. apart. Unless you're Pantera, of course. Yeah. No one can play that fucking music. But, um, 
but yeah, I'd, I'd love to have known what what happened. <laughs> it will come out one day. <laughs> All right, then, folks. Thanks for watching. Layers. This has been Maiden Cast, and we shall see you next week. Next Take week. care, y'all.